My name is Ernest. I'm a postdoc at the Julius Rabinowitz Center. Um, I do work in finance and growth. This afternoon, we will have three speakers on the topic of decentralization. First speaker will be Steve Waltman, who is a programmer and writer, and he maintains a blog about economics and finance called Interfluidity. And uh, he will tell us about decentralization of financial system and banking, I would say, the Taoism of decentralization. Is that fair? Um, Who knows? <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. OK. Um, and fun. Rachel will be the second speaker, who is an assistant professor in information systems and computer science at Georgia State. <coughs> and, oh, Georgia Tech. And uh, the topic is? It's on market design for our personal data. And so we'll be talking about how we can think about designing and then perhaps decentralizing those markets. So privacy-related uh, decentralization. All right. And the third speaker uh, is Iona um, Marinescu, who is an assistant professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, who will be talking to us about market power and monopsony power in the labor markets. Okay. And the format will be the same as this morning. We will have 20 minutes of presentation and then Q&A after each and the individual speaker. Speaker. Okay. So um, thanks. Can you guys hear me, or do I need to talk into this thing? Is this, you guys here? Yes, yes, no, maybe, OK. Um, and I have some kind of clicker thing. How exciting. OK, um, I'm going to start a timer so that I don't, I'm not ridiculous. Um, a few things. Everything I'm going to say is going to be basically obvious and wrong. Um, I'm just making a lot of assertions for your interest. Challenge you, I hope interest you, maybe, maybe not. Another thing that's weird is I'm a terrible speaker. I put together slide decks that are crazy. You're not going to be able to follow my tech slides. They're my notes now. They're your notes after the talk if you're interested. Right? But there are going to be like goofy diagrams and stuff, so you can follow that stuff. OK, let's get going. So um, I started, um, I, I did a lot of writing during the financial crisis. And I have always been a big proponent of decentralization. Woohoo! Um, and I think you know, we did a terrible thing. I think, that, I think the resolution of the financial crisis was awful. The number of US banks has been dropping, accelerated a little bit during the financial crisis. They stopped giving charters for de novo banks after the financial crisis. The asset share of the top five banks went way up prior to the financial crisis and has stayed up. Right From my perspective, it's horrible. It's a terribly centralized solution, centralized resolution. I think of the giant banks down the street here as oppressors. I detest them. And yet they still rule the world despite having screwed it up. Atif commented earlier about how we had like arrangements prior to the financial crisis that meant we had to kick 4 million people out of their banks. We also had FDICIA, which said that we had to resolve those banks before they did stuff like that, prompt corrective action. Somehow the law was enforced against homeowners, but not against those banks. So I hate those people. What I wanted to do, what I advocated for at the time, is we should have put those banks in receivership. We should have, we should have you know, written off all the equity holders. We should have really been mean to the management of the banks, made sure they were terribly punished. Um, and then we should have gradually reorganized them into smaller entities and slowly cycle them back out into the world. What if we had done that? Yay, we'd have had decentralization. Woohoo! I love that stuff. Yay. Um, you know, and then after that, couldn't the market just regulate things? That would be great. And of course, thinking it through at the time then and now, the answer is obviously no. Right? We would still need um, competition would not be enough. We couldn't just impose size caps to prevent the kind of crisis that occurred then from happening we would still need some kind of regulatory system. Why? Because decentralization is always unstable. Right? This is a conjecture, an assertion. Everything I'm making is a conjecture and assertion. You can take issue with it if you want. Um, but I think it, uh, the um, historical experience is that when we decentralize something, starts out decentralized, we can come up with these clever games in equilibria about why we think it's going to be decentralized. But kind of Marx's core insight from the 19th century that somehow concentrations of power emerge and those concentrations of, of powers build on each other always seems to take hold. Um, took hold during prior to the financial crisis. If we would have just broken up the banks after the fact, would have taken a hold again. Things would have been too important, too special, too critical, even if we cut down on asset side or any particular measure. Right? So how would we achieve decentralization in a resilient way? 
well, this is what I advocated at the time, would still advocate in theory, is that, well, we should break up the things and make a decentralized system to start with, but we would have to have had a regulatory community that committed as a first order mandate to maintaining market structure, right? Meaning market structure should not be a decentralized outcome, should not be the result of a decentralized process. If we want a decentralized system that's durable, we have to commit to market structure, and we have to figure out how to get regulators, how to design a regulatory regime that could maintain a market structure. How can you do that in a way consistent with freedom? Well, the, ob well, the obvious one thing to do, the thing that I advocated being done, um, was that we should have very wily regulators who are always looking at ways that banks are becoming special, becoming more interconnected, developing network effects, making themselves indispensable in some fashion or another. We should think about all of the ways that they do that, and we should tax those things so that banks are still free, so that we don't have a centralized mandate, oh, you have to run your business this way or that, but we should impose graduated levels of taxes that make it very, very difficult in an evolving way for any bank to ever become super important. Right? Um, so this is a conjecture, an idea, and I'm sort of generalizing it into the title of this talk which is the Tao of de decentralization, which is my claim. Again, all I'm doing is claiming stuff, making assertions. You can tell me why they're wrong or why it's bullshit after. Um, that you can't really have a decentralized system or a centralized system and have it be any good. That any interesting social system, any valuable social system is going to be a marbling of centralization and decentralization. Um, you're going to need centralized elements to help ironically ensure the continuance of the decentralized parts. If you don't have decentralized elements, you're going to get a bunch of failure modes, right? Michelle Zarenlov, oligarchy. If you don't have decentralized elements, um, the problems that you're going to have are going to look like, oh, I can't find it here. Um, the Lord Acton problem, the power corrupts absolutely problem. Um, if you have a pure centralized system, whoever runs it is going to be too powerful, and you're going to have the sort of high modernism problem that James Scott identified of if you have a very centralized system, the rulers don't have very much feedback. So instead of thinking about whether or not we want to decentralize or centralize, I guess I come from a community, a blockchain community, where decentralization is taken to be like a buzzword for things that are inherently good. Like we want decentralization. If it's decentralized, it's awesome. If you're doing something centralizing, you're, you're inherently bad. right? So what I want to suggest is that's a shitty way to think about the world, that there are virtues associated with decentralized systems. The ones that matter to me most are about human agency, the agency of consistency of, of constituents in a decentralized system as a human being or as a small community. I can have sort of a meaningful effect over my own world, whereas I'm subject to some centralized command institution. I don't have that effect. In the blockchain community world, the big thing that um, blockchains provide allegedly through decentralization is resistance to corruption. Um, these are all sort of virtues attributed to decentralized systems. Um, there are also virtues attributable to centralized systems, right? Centralized systems are more scalable, they're more adroit, they can, um, you can, decentralized systems always have a lot of redundancy, you can sort of organize resources. Um, I think it's interesting to talk about these two systems in terms of kind of a Hayekian view of how information works, where somehow everybody in the whole community broadcasts through something like a price vector information that's of interest to everybody else and um, Weberian information flows, right? People who are Hayekian kind of forget that centralized systems were designed, bureaucracies were designed explicitly around the question of information flows as well, just a different architecture. And things that are more Hayekian are better at serving internal goals, things having to do with the welfare of participants, but things that are more Weberian are good at, are good at um, serving external goals, right? So if you want to win a war, you're not so interested in maintaining the price vector that makes sure that things you don't know about in tiny communities are welfare maximizing. You're interested in getting a summary of the information that's necessary to conduct external things in the rest of the world, and you're willing to let you know, the welfare of constituents, you can kill them off if, they're, if, if that's going to help you win the war. 
right? Very different kinds of systems. In reality, most systems are something between, say, an army trying to win a war or an idealized economy of agents where we're trying to maximize a social welfare function having to do with the welfare of agents. Most real social organizations are something between that. And we want to mix decentralized and centralized components in a way um, that will be appropriate for that system. Um, OK. Um, so this sort of, that's sort of part one of this talk. The next part, this is a talk sort of in three parts, um, is to think about, well, if that's true, which again, everything I say could be bullshit, usually is. Um, but if that's true, then we have to think really hard about the question of, well, for the centralized components of the system, like how are they going to be run, right? Centralized components have this problem that there's a central authority at the top who controls that part of the system, and they're you know, corruptible. How do we know they're going to do good things? And usually the answer to this problem is some form of democracy. So by democracy, I don't mean anything in particular. Lots of the kinds of mechanisms that Glenn proposes would qualify as democracy, or for example, Robin's suggestion this morning as a way of trying to aggregate people's preferences in a price system is democratic in some sense. Some system that's going to take feedback in some formalized way from the broad community and aggregate it into a decision or a choice. Um, that's all I mean by democracy. Um, there are lots of slides I'm going to skip here. We're sort of interested in creating systems that match freedom and function. Um, the thing I'm going to say is that we're trying, we're going for something that's between a purely decentralized system, which on the one hand is resilient and beautiful, but hard to manage and often fragile, and introduce an exotic or introduce a developer who wants, to, who wants to build houses in this thing and it doesn't have any way to resist. Purely centralized system, the problem with the purely centralized system is that you can, it'll do exactly what its leader tells it to do. So if the leader steers it into a um, tree, it will, it will do that. Um, and what we want is a mixed system with Hayekian feedback, right? If you try to drive the horse into the tree, it won't work. But you can still drive the horse. Somebody's still driving it, right? So it's a metaphor I like for trying to think. We're not going for totally decentralized or totally centralized. We're trying to go for a system with good properties where there is some kind of some centralized components, but decentralized elements allow for feedback that makes it less likely for really terrible things to happen. Um, OK. Next up, I have a lot of stuff that I'm kind of going to skip because I wouldn't have time to go through it all. But the next step I want to get to is just a set of conjectures about this idea of democracy. Um, this also kind of came up a little bit obliquely in, in Robin's talk, which is that we have a lot of problems. The way that we do democracy right now is like terrible. Like, I, think, I think democracy is killing us, not because democracy is a bad idea, but the way that we're doing it is absolutely killing us. Um, so first thing to note is that we, we talk about democracy like it's a straightforward thing, but there are huge tensions in democracy. Right? Majority rule means winner take all. So if you have a political community that's roughly 50-50 divided, then you know, whichever one has 50 plus one gets to win. That's majority rule. There's this other notion that everybody should have a voice. Right? Sometimes we can fudge that because we could have a legislature that brings in people from both sides and represents everybody. But that's just a matter of happenstance. Right? That's just a matter of clustering. If everybody is uniformly distributed, the minority community has no voice in the legislature either. Right? Um, there are tremendous tensions between these two ideals, majority rule and winner take all. They're obviously very rel relevant to our political community right now, where, where one sort of, say, call it 49% of our political community has a president and doesn't feel illegitimate because the alternative would be being oppressed from their perspective by the other 51%. So why should that 1%? Why does all legitimacy turn on that 1%? It's not really, it's not really clear that it should. Um, this is something that you guys know, I'm sure, at some level. But I want to emphasize that I think it's sort of the most important thing to realize about our current democracy. Um, this is winner take all voting, right? Whoever has 50% or more wins. Um, does this thing work? No, it doesn't matter. Um, in this kind of system, if we imagine that there's one undecided voter in the world, and everybody else is lined up. The people on the left are surely going to vote for, let's call it party A of two parties. Um, and then the decreasing, we're going towards decreasing preference for party A from left to right. Um, if we had certainty, 
if everybody's vote was perfectly certain, then there's only one person in the middle who ultimately decides a question, right? It's like the Senate when it's tied, right? So in this version of certainty, effectively everybody's vote is worthless, except for the one nearly indifferent person. Now, real elections aren't like that, but real elections are very much like this, where from the perspective of any given voter, there's uncertainty in terms of the, in the expected number to vote for party A. If you know that it's gonna be a majority, if you live in New York and you're voting for, say, president, you know it's gonna be majority for the Democrats, the marginal effect of your vote. So this graph is showing the probability of party, the top is a probability that party A wins, um, given the expected vote share. Um, and the bottom graphs, which are the more interesting, are the marginal effect of an individual voter, given that same percentage expected to vote. Right? If you already know party A is going to win, if you're in this region, you don't have to vote. Right? Lots of people do this. Right? I live in a safe red state, a safe blue state. I don't need to vote. It doesn't have any difference. It's only when we're in the middle here that a marginal vote counts, that it's worthwhile to vote, right? So I think we underappreciate the effect of this. Because what does it mean? It means that on the one hand, the election is determined by a very small group of people, in the limiting case, one person, in a more realistic case, a very small number of people, and they're the people who are least interested in the dimensions by which the core parties differ. Right? If party A is the party of oranges and party B is the party of bananas, then the people who dislike both oranges and bananas and so don't care are the ones who decide the election. Right? They're the only ones who effectively decide the election if we're, they're approximately evenly matched. Now we should expect in this kind of winner-take-all system, they will be approximately evenly matched most of the time because the parties are strategic entities, right? When the Democratic Party loses three elections in a row, it turns all Bill Clinton-y in Republican light, right? Now that everybody's, everything's changing, the parties change, right? In a two-party democracy, we're gonna end up with a situation where things are often quite evenly balanced, which means the election is gonna turn on the behavior of the few people who are most indifferent to the actual outcomes of the election, which is an absolute invitation to tremendous attempts at corruption, influence campaigns, things of this sort, right? Ultimately, it's all about trying to sway a small number of people however you can. From a party's perspective, it's about trying to get to this point where you're roughly 50-50, where most of your blocks are reliably polarized, Obviously, you'd like everybody to be polarized in your direction, but you've got a competitor, so you get towards 50-50, and then there are these swing voters who are very few, and you're looking to buy them off. You're looking to bribe them. You're looking at anything you can do, because anything that you do in this region here has tremendous influence over the outcome of the election. To me, this is sort of like it's an attractive nuisance, like leaving you know, gold bricks in the center of Times Square and then going, oh my God, somebody stole those gold bricks. Oh my God, the Republicans stole the election. Oh my God, the Russians did it. It's like, well, of course. If it's turning on the outcome of four people, then they're gonna, somebody's gonna do stuff like that. Don't be surprised, it's stupid, but it's not what we want, right? It's, it's, it's a bad thing. And I, I think it's bad, more than it's bad about the outcome of elections, it's bad about what it does to us. The strategic behavior of parties means they're going to polarize us into two approximately equivalent blocks. And then what's left is not an election, but a competitive influence campaign. That's what our political community is. That's what our voting system does to us predictably. The hard question to answer, the interesting question, is why did it take so long to get to this point? So I, I think this is literally killing us. What would be better? Um, ideally, it would be the case that the probability that party A wins is directly proportionate to, the to, the, to its share in the electorate. Now that's hard to think about, right? Because it leads to sort of really random outcomes. But at least from this perspective of everybody's vote counting equally, that would be a nice characteristic if everybody's vote counted equally. Um, and it has a nice characteristic that there's no, that the cost of trying to manipulate an election is very high, right? If you, if, you can, if you can buy two or three percent of the voters, you're only ever going to get a two or three percent advantage from doing that. Whereas in our existing system, if you can buy two or three percent of the voters, you've reliably bought the election. Right? 
So it's much, much more resilient to corruption. So is it possible to do something like this? Yes, so there was a proposal from the, I don't know, the 80s, this guy. He's here now, I think he's at Columbia now, Akil Riyad Amara, um, put out this idea of lottery voting. Um, lottery voting is this very simple idea. Just, we're trying to elect somebody to be something. We put their name on a ballot. We, we, everybody puts who they want on the ballot. Maybe the ballot is limited to the main candidates, whatever, there are 10 candidates. Um, you check your ballot, you throw it in a hat. At the end of the day, you pull a ballot out of, out of the hat, that's the winner, right? It's just a lottery for who wins, right? And the, the structure of the lottery is determined by how many people voted for which candidate. If 80% of the people voted for candidate A, then that per candidate has an 80% chance of winning, 20% chance of losing. Now, obviously, you wouldn't do this with a hat, but social randomness, reliable social randomness, turns out not to be a difficult problem. Um, you wouldn't obviously want to, it's hard to talk about electing a president this way, although you can think about variations on it that would get some of the benefits. But you absolutely can talk about electing a legislature this way. We should be doing this now for the House of Representatives, in my view, right? Because even though in any given election, right, you could get a representative that in your district only got 10% of the votes, what's more interesting, what's more important to a legislature isn't whether or not your particular district got the representative that it want, but the statistical characteristics of the legislature as a whole, right? And by a law of law, if you got, you know, 400 and some odd people in a legislature, the party that got 80% of the votes is gonna get 80% of the seats with a small margin of error, with a little bit of noise. Random ballot for legislatures gives you proportional representation, not just by political party, but by any measure that, that voters care about. If voters care about race, if they care about gender, if they care about your loving to be a coin collector, whatever it is, the proportion that's gonna arise in the legislature is gonna be proportionate to those votes. Um, let's see what I'm, oh, I'm over time. Um, okay, so that's a pitch for that. I'm going to hurry because I'm already, I'm already past time. Um, there are variations on this theme. Um, the last pitch I want to make, I call it psychotomy mesis. I work in blockchains now. I work on, um, I work in Ethereum programming. I want to kind of make a pitch for it. Um, I think the interesting thing about blockchain so far um, is that we, we've, we're talking about mechanisms in this conference, and there are lots of clever mechanisms. Glenn's book is full of really interesting and clever mechanisms, and Robin gave us a very clever mechanism this morning, and there are lots more I'm sure we'll hear. Um, but there's no path to trying out these mechanisms on a large scale because they're radical, right? They're hard. How can you sort of get a government, to, a, a polity as a whole, to try out something wacky? We need experiments. Conventional social science is not very good at this. It's better at looking at what's occurred, at running small experiments with low stakes. We need somehow a petri dish. Um, I work in blockchains. Blockchain experiments are, have a lot of external validity. We can see this because they have reproduced a lot of pathologies with tremendous fidelity. So in the Ethereum community, there's something called the DAO hack. The, the, I, the whole ethos behind blockchain communities is code is was, code is law, you shouldn't intervene, whatever. And then all of a sudden, there was this experiment that was too big to fail that meant that 15% of the value of the network was going to be stolen by a hacker. And the community came in and intervened, violating all ex post norms, exactly in the same way as we do with financial crises. Right? We had an ICO bubble that looks incredibly much like a traditional equity bubble from its behavior in terms of financial markets, from how the entities funded behaved, all of the swag that we had in the 90s tech bubble, we had briefly in the ICO bubble. These things happened very fast and on a except very, what's that? Except it was way quicker. Except it was way quicker, <laughs> exactly. On a smaller and faster scale. And these are markets that we can sketch changes to very quickly. We can iterate on these things very fast. So people are upset, oh my god, these experiments have been pathological. They've been, no, they've been pathological failures in really interesting ways, in ways that look relevant to the social world. So what I want to encourage is to think of these things not as this new thing that's going like, to get rid of money and change the world and make everything so much better. No, this is an experimental petri dish like nothing else that we have or have ever had. Um, I'm going to skip this. There's no other petri dish like it. There's nothing else we can use for these kinds of experiments where people have real economic stakes that are valuable to them. 
um, in experiments that we can design and implement without a lot of regulatory hassle. There's nothing like it. We should be doing it, you guys. I'm working on software for which you guys are the potential audience, sort of researchers trying to come up with experiments. My sort of last weird thing is that we should think about it like psychotomimesis, right? So psychedelics, when they were first discovered, when LSD was first discovered, its first use was psychotomimetic, right? A psychologist thought, oh, I can know what it's like to be schizophrenic now, <laughs> right? Like this is a model psychosis. Right now, um, that's, what, that's what blockchain stuff is, right? It's not saving the world. It's not making, you know, it's not eliminating fiat money or anything else. It's reproducing interesting pathologies really interestingly in a way that we can play with and tweak and iterate on. And I think that's what we should start by thinking about it. It's really exciting to have something where we can make realistically pathological social systems on demand very quickly, try them out, and watch their pathologies evolve. And eventually, maybe, we can get to the point where we're generating things that are no longer psychotomimetic, but that are psychedelic, mind expanding. Maybe we'll use these things to end up making new, very successful social systems. But even if not, it's very exciting to be able to make the screwed up ones, watch how they play out, try games like the kinds of mechanisms that Glenn and Robin and others describe with stakes that are very real to participants and see how they work and how they fail. So I think the best way to think about the blockchain stuff is a really exciting petri dish if you're interested in social systems and mechanism design. And I really want to encourage you to think about them that way, especially as researchers. It's accessible to everybody. It's, it doesn't have to be so hard. And that's it. <laughs> So I'm just curious on the last point, can you give examples of what has been tried that have, there is more of a collaboration with social science? Well, there, there haven't been so many collaborations with social scientists. That's why I'm here. Um, so most. Can you describe what might be a possibility? Just an example. Sure. Get a sense of. Well, let's take any mechanism that we're interested in. So suppose that we are going to want to play around with quadratic voting. Um, it's very easy on blockchain, in a blockchain system, we can have a thing that is going to allocate value, economic value, right? That tends to be galvanizing to people. When an organization has a budget over which they have some control, that tends to galvanize some participation, right? So we can design a social insurance scheme or a philanthropy scheme or a venture capital scheme that is gonna try allocating its resources by quadratic voting and compare that to other voting schemes. We can try something like Robin's experiment. We can obviously try it with a city with property value, but if we think of something else that's valuable um, and we want, to, we want to use conditional value as prediction markets and conditional value as a measure of how we make decisions in terms of the easiest thing to do in blockchain systems now is allocate funds, although they, they could do more elaborate things. We can very easily sketch that out. Prediction markets are one of the few of these sort of social science applications that are kind of widely experimented with at this point. People uh, want to try out Futarchy. What? Auctions. Auctions, right? Auction schemes. Uh, sort of mm -hmm. Sure. Further for, for understand that. So mm -hmm. let's take quadratic voting as an example. Mm -hmm. Sure. I can, as a social scientist, if I'm interested in quadratic voting, I can implement that in the usual traditional field experiment way as well. Uh, so what I'm trying to understand is what advantage do I get from the blockchain stuff that I cannot do yeah, well, you, so you can implement it in a field experiment. If you do implement it in a field experiment, can you give the participants stakes that are of significantly meaningful value to them? Like, this is the hard thing. The, the hard thing about this blockchain stuff is it does hurt, right? A lot of people lost a lot of money um, in these experiments. Um, if you, if you want value to be significant, if you want to conduct this kind of experiment using traditional infrastructure, and there's going to be significant value involved, then you're going to need regulated fiduciaries involved. You're going to need lawyers setting up contracts. It's expensive. Right? Blockchain technology is mostly about making things that were expensive cheap. That's it. Right? It's about taking the fiduciary sphere, accountants and lawyers and all of that stuff, which is, takes time to work with, is expensive to work with, and is inaccessible to most people for social reasons to work with and make all of that stuff much, much cheaper. Now, as an academic researcher, you have a problem. There's a big hole in my story for trying to encourage academic researchers, which is no institutional review board worth its salt would permit the kinds of experiments I'm proposing, because in order to be good experiments, the stakes have to be high enough that people can get hurt some. Um, so that's a real question. 
Um, so part of why blockchains have taken off to the degree that they have is they circumvent a lot of these kinds of regulatory ideas to some degree. Um, and so part of why it might be interesting, part of why it's interesting to people interested in experimentation, maybe not academic researchers, is because it circumvents that. There are things that would prevent you from running experiments that you might otherwise want to run from a regulatory perspective that you can get around. I do, I'm not trying to argue that it's a good idea to experiment reckless, recklessly or to hurt people. Um, on the contrary, blockchain experiments have the characteristic that they're, that they're opt-in, and responsible blockchain experiments should do their best to, to, try to, to try to put boundaries around the harm. We haven't done a good job of that. The ICO boom hurt a lot of people, and I think that's something that we should be really cognizant of. Um, but at the same time, um, we can make these experiments quite quickly. We can, we can get a fair amount of capital involved from people who are willing to participate in a sort of psychotomimetic way, right? From people, the, I think the thing ethically to avoid is the kind of speculative, the general speculative boom that attached to the ICO boom, this, I, this thing that made it very widely public. The thing to encourage is for groups of people who are aware that they're basically participating in an experiment that's likely to go awry, that's psychotic, that's not the general public. Sort of the, the guinea pigs of the research, as it was with psychedelics before Timothy Leary came along and generalized it, the guinea pigs of the experimentation should be the experimenting community itself. Um, it's a kind of self-experiment. But people who are going in eyes first can put in enough stake to matter, can iterate and try different things quite quickly. Um, and we can see what happens um, in a way that I think you, there's nothing you can do on a blockchain you can't do without if you're willing to pay lawyers enough, if you're willing to get buy-in from regulators, right? If you, can, if you can be the Iowa elections exchange, you can play around with prediction markets and, and not go to jail because you managed to get a no action letter from them. Um, but the costs of using the traditional system for these kinds of experiments, especially if it's going to be at a scale that's meaningful to the participants, is extraordinarily high. Whereas the, the costs, both in terms of the work required to do the thing and in terms of the fact that things can fly under the radar, that you're not participating in a, in a system made up of effectively risk-averse regulators, which the conventional financial system is for a lot of good reasons. Um, makes it possible to try things, to play with things that I, I don't think you can easily do outside of it unless you're willing to sort of nominate a very trustworthy individual who becomes then a subject of a great deal of legal risk themselves. If you say like, okay, well, we're going to set up this quadratic voting game and Glenn's just going to keep all the money until we allocate it, right? That's pretty risky for Glenn. <laughs>